So we're going to start. Dr. Alaika has a bachelor from the University of Toronto, a master in science in the University of Edinburgh, and PhD in the University of Toronto. Currently, she is an Isaac Walton Killian Memorial Post postdoctoral fellow at the University of Alberta and the director of the project Imperial Animal Management Strategy in Cusco, Peru, tracking social and environmental sustainability through faunal remains and isotope analysis. Her main research interests include human-animal interaction, bioarchaeology, isotope analysis, and then archaeology, political economy, and pastoralism. Her PhD involved the study of the exploitation and veneration of animal species among the moche of the north coast of Peru. She examined, examined the moche iconography record, faunal remains from the Middle Horizon sites of Huaca, Colorado, and Tecapa, and undertook a systematic isotope analysis of human and animal remains to interpret the role of wild and domestic, domesticated species in the daily lives seasonal gatherings, and ritual practice of coastal communities. Her current postdoctoral research addressed the role and influence of Wadi imperial expansion during the middle horizon of the Cusco region. The central objective of his research is to realize the way that local group of Cusco region were responding to environmental and political transformation to shed light on the obstacles faced by these communities and the resilience in the face of change. So again, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alaika with a talk entitled Food, Trade and Ritual, Human-Animal Interaction Among the Moche of the North Coast Peru. Alexa, you can start. Oh, thank you, John. Let me just share my screen. So let me know if there's any issues with um, our presentation. Um, but I really wanted to welcome everybody to the talk today. Thank you for attending. Um, a special thank you to John Cruz, um, John Percy Cruz Quinones and the rest of the organization committee for the invitation. So before I begin, I'd like to state that as a representative of the University of Alberta, I acknowledge that I'm a grateful guest on the traditional territory of Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Sioux, um, the Iroquois, Dene, as well as Ojibwe, Salto, and Anishinaabe nations. These lands are now known as part of Treaty 6, 7, and 8, and the homeland of the Métis. I, along with the University of Alberta, respect the sovereignty, knowledge systems, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations. So I've also been a grateful guest on the lands of Quechua Aymara and other ethno-linguistic communities of contemporary Peru. And I thank the many communities that have allowed for my continued work in the region. This talk is based on my recently completed doctoral research and would not have been possible without the community of San Lorenzo de Hatanka in the Southern Jequitepeque Valley of Northern Peru, all local and international participants on the Canyencio Regional Archeological Project, as well as to family and friends. So it's been a great honor um, to have the privilege to conduct research in the Andes, and I acknowledge how fortunate I am to contribute to revealing more about the cultural patrimony of descendant communities. So I began working in northern Peru in 2010. You can see the sweeping desert landscapes bisected by lush river valleys that characterize this north coast landscape. It is here in the Canyoncio region of so the southern Jequitepeque Valley that sparked my interest in the ways that communities were sustaining their practices related to marine exploitation, agriculture, and herding in the face of shifting political and religious ideologies. My contribution to excavations and analysis of moche cultural contexts left me with questions about the way that animals and their constraints and affordances influence the daily tasks of human communities, but also the nature of animals as food, facilitators of trade, and their involvement in ritual practices. This presentation will situate this research project and its objectives, establish broader Andean and Moche cosmologies, and link ar uh, archaeological evidence to my central overarching argument. 
I employed iconographic, zooarchaeological, and isotopic evidence to ask three questions about the role of animals in Moche society. How were animals depicted? Which species were consumed and which were offered in ritual? And what did they eat and where did they come from? I'll conclude this talk by uh, discussing some of the ways that animals are valued as powerful symbols in Moche ideologies. Before I frame this research, it's important to state that the central hypothesis of this project was that the life ways and biological rhythms of animals largely dictated the domestic, political, and ritual schedules underwriting social life. So the study of animals has been a topic of discussion and debate for centuries, from animal experimentation to animal sacrifice and animals as sentient beings. Our world is woven with the temporalities of animal groups, their daily and annual cycles, and their presence in our lives. The history of animal studies in the Western world begins in the Enlightenment period and with the work of classifying animal groups into taxonomies by Carl Linnaeus. This early approach to understanding how animal groups differed amongst themselves with the main distinguishing feature that they are not like us, humans. In his 1735 published Systema Naturae, Linnaeus described humans, homo, with the simple phrase, nosce te ipsum, to know thyself. So it's this notion of understanding oneself that becomes a key force in later work of scholars questioning the right of humans to dominate and categorize the animal world. Donna Haraway's work on animals began to question our separation of the human and animal world by suggesting that we, we would be better off thinking about other animals in our lives as companion species rather than as pets or property. For instance, Donna Haraway's book, Primate Visions, examines how dioramas created for the American Museum of Natural History showed family groups that conformed to the traditional human nuclear family, which misrepresented the um, animal's observed behavior in the wild. Critical approaches in animal studies have also considered representations of non-human animals in popular culture, including species diversity in animated films. By highlighting these issues, animal studies strives to re-examine traditional ethical, political, and epistemological categories in the context of a renewed attention to and respect for animal life. The recent attention in particular brought to the use of animals in experimental laboratories and for testing products emphasizes a fundamental shift in the way that we identify it with animals in a cap capitalist as well as mechanized world. So my analysis of moche life ways and animals is informed by ethnographic analogies to help interpret the meaning of their representation and use. For instance, the work of Dransart in Isuga, Chile has revealed that herders recognize their camelids as individuals, camelids being uh, domesticated llamas and alpacas, differentiated from the wild species of Vicuña and Guanaco. During the Wainu ceremony, the ears of llamas and alpacas are cut so that the herders may distinguish herd animals owned by human beings from wild unmarked animals which belong to the spirits of the hills. There are numerous ways that llamas and alpacas can be marked, which include tassels, bells, and earrings. Some moche ceramics from the north coast of Peru depict modeled camelids with patterns of cut marks around their ears. Dransart observed that bloodletting from the ears of domesticated animals constitutes an indigenous ritual practice, more specifically a rite of passage for the llamas and alpacas at the time of their initiation into sexual maturity. In fact, these rites coincided with ear piercing ceremonies and the ritual investiture of the breech cloth for noble Inca boys, which formed part of the Cafactaimi celebrations at the time of the winter solstice. This ceremony was known as the Warichikui, or Wara, meaning loincloth, but in many areas, Christian evangelization eradicated the Indian practice of making boys' ears bleed in such ceremonial rites of passage. The similarity between the ear cutting ceremony involving yamas and young boys affirms the parallel and interrelated life cycles of both humans and animals. In the Andes, scholars have considered animals as metaphors for specific groups of people, depending on their class, status, and political affiliation. While in Amazonian context, Viveros de Castro contends that self, knowledge, and one's perspective of the world are determined by the corporeal being of distinct species, in which culture is constant and nature is variable or multinatural. 
Therefore, the assembling of different actors partly predetermines their role as powerful agents, potentially non-human persons or exploitable resources. Acknowledging that animals can have important agentive purposes permits the interpretation of their active role in commensal, daily, ceremonial, and sociopolitical interactions. So to interpret the role of animals, it's not simply a matter of transplanting distinct Amerindian or other indigenous ideologies to the Andes, but rather recognizing that Western enlightenment notions of the separation between the human and animal worlds are not universal. Beliefs about how non-human entities are related to human communities depend on the historical and environmental context, but also the daily subsistence practices that dictate temporalities and long-term activities. In the Cordillera Blanca region of the Central Andes, deer are linked to the Apus or mountain spirits. The term for deer in this region is tarugo and is one of the various animals that belongs to the abuelitos or grandfathers. Walter attests to the association between avalanches and the breath of the deer or rauh tarush, in which the deer is the personification of the mountain. Therefore, the way societies perceive the natural world depends on the types of engagements that these communities have with specific groups of non-human beings. Non-human beings structured the lives of humans in various ways. Water, for example, constituted the overarching element in the lives of contemporary and past communities in the Andes, in which it is the main element of the Andean cosmos. Quote, the principle that explains movement, circulation, and forces of change, the essence of life itself, end quote. Two pillars that frame this worldview and impact the circulation and movement of water are the Apus, the mountains, and Mamacocha, Mother Lake. Mountain worship is widespread throughout the Andes, with communities leaving offerings to mountain deities. Among the Moche, mountain worship is evident in their representation of mountains in ceramic vessels, their construction of sites in relation to important mountains, and more broadly in the Andean world, offering marine shell to mountain wakas. The use of spondyla shell in many ritual events symbolizes the ocean and its role in ensuring agricultural renewal and the circulation of water. A key aspect in the circulation of water is the celestial bodies that shift between seasons. A prominent dark constellation is the yakana or black yama. This animal figure guides the circulation of water from the kaipacha, this world, to the hananpacha, the world above, that returns to the apus and, as rain and eventually leads to the uhupacha, the world below. In Indian cosmology, the Yama serves as the main guide that ensures that water is brought back to earth and allows for waters to flow to fertilize the Pachamama, Mother Earth. Along with their vital water symbolism, camelids form the basis of the calendar of agro-pastoral communities. In the highlands, ethno-historical records attest to the importance of the Nyawi, the dark Yama constellation, that appears at the end of the austral summer to mark the end of the harvest, the time for foddering animals in the stubble of harvested crops, and when the Pachamama goes to sleep. In the Choquiquira region of Cusco, the agropastoral calendar during the Inca period was celebrated with the sacrifice of multicolored yamas, the preparation of harvested potatoes, and the beginning of the bartering season. The dry season encompasses preparing agricultural fields for planting with the end of this calendrical phase marked by the sacrifice of brown and reddish yamas. In the end, it's apparent that quotidian activities ensured these animals were cared for but camelid annual cycles in breeding, birthing, and the selection of coat colors may have been principal motivators for communities to attend to these animals and to differentially value them. In pre-colonial periods, camelids and other animals held specific value for daily tasks, interregional interaction, and ritual. And in this talk, I focus on the moche. So who were the moche? The moche refers not so much to a bounded ethnic group, but to a political and religious ideology adopted by different communities spanning the desert north coast of Peru from the early intermediate and middle horizon periods between 200 and 900 CE. Scholars have suggested that unprecedented social stratification characterized Moche society, leading many to argue that the Moche formed one of the earliest state polities in the Americas. The evidence for social stratification and inequality is the great wealth disparity in tombs and other burial contexts of the Moche period. We find elaborate gold necklaces, silver and shell inlaid earrings, as well as elaborate ceramics. As you can see in the slide here, two of the most well-known moche sites, Sipan and Huacacal Viejo, both are locations of these elaborate discoveries. Recent research suggesting that periods of centralization alternated with fragmentation in different regions of the North Coast, 
Um, so a monolithic label of, this, of state is somewhat erroneous to apply widely. The Moche are famed for the beauty of their ceramics, including most famously the icon iconographic um, portrait vessels. Among these ceramics, there are elaborated and detailed iconographic scenes. The iconographic corpus of the Moche includes the well-known presentation scene, burial theme, and revolt of the objects. These scenes are composed of anthropomorphic and human figures in the acts of assisting a principal deity, identified as Ai Ai Paye. These attendants are commonly regaled in patterned tunics, headdresses, and belts terminating in the heads of snakes. Among these figures, there are various animal species that accompany the human and human-like figures. These include owls, ospreys, deer, fox, dog, as well as camelids. Notable deer depictions focus on hunting scenes where elite individuals are armed with atlatls and accompanied by dogs. Deer are also often anthropomorphized where their heads and antlers used in the depiction of warriors and prisoners. Research by Goldfield has highlighted how dualism structured the way that wild and domesticated species were perceived by pre-contact indigenous societies of the Andes. He quotes the work of Hokanim and the role of deer in Moche iconography as intermediary between humans and ancestors, as deer, quote, lives at the limit between cultivated lands and wild lands, moves from the valleys to the mountains, appears during the dry season and disappears during the wet season, can pass from the world of the living to that of the dead, of which it is often the representative, the temporary refuge or the associate, end quote. Donnan further considers the way that deer, the deer hunt scene parallels the ritual capture for, of sacrifice for mo, uh, moche ceremonial practices, and that in a symbolic way, the capture of deer during a hunt was equated with the capture of a prisoner to be later sacrificed at a moche temple. Nonetheless, the symbolic importance of deer may have structured the exploitation and distribution of deer and many other animals in moche settlements, and this project attempted to better investigate different lines of evidence to uncover the way that idealized animal depictions were reflected in their exploitation and deposition in the archeological record. Despite the plethora of animal depictions on various kinds of moche ceramics and metallurgy, there have been few attempts to interpret how the representations encode moche conceptions and ideologies of animals themselves with notable exceptions being uh, from the work of Benson, Bourget, as well as Gaupierre. So it's possible to approximate these cultural constructions by comparing such representations with the presence, absence, and differential treatment of certain species in the zoarchaeological record, and even the diversity of animal management strategies as reflected in isotope variation. So before I introduce the site of Huacaco Arada, it's essential to establish how researchers have explored the treatment of human and animal bodies and death during the Moche period. Weissmantel argues that there is a stark contrast in Moche mortuary practice between curated mortuary interments and exposed sacrificial victims, especially in terms of wholeness and fragmentation, two opposing states freighted with symbolic meaning. While Weissmantel's analysis focuses on the head and the reuse of moche tombs for interacting with the deceased, her work highlights alternate moche constructions of the partable self. Weissmantel cites Hecker and Hecker, who suggest that heads are parts that represent the whole, or pars pro toto. This suggestion that parts of the human body, namely the head, could have held potency to recall the whole individual, their status and role in society, also seems to have applied to animals as potentially partable or hybrid beings. Weissmantel points to the connection between decapitated heads of sacrificed yamas and humans and their possible similar symbolic position within Moche worldview. Miller's analysis of yama burials uh, in various sites in the Moche as well as Viru valleys of the North Coast supports many of Weissmantel's conclusions. At Huancaco, artifacts were forced down the throats of 15 yamas prior to their sacrifice. Some were found with parts of cut shells and others were fed different materials, some up to six objects. The active incorporation of other kinds of materials into the bodies of these animals is reminiscent of the forced inclusion of other human body parts in the 70 human individuals found in platform two of Huaca de la Luna. Bourget documented the insertion of body parts and other materials into four victims, such as a rib and human jaw forced into the sacrum and rib cage of one victim, a toe introduced to the pelvis of another, and the finger bone between the ribs of a third. 
The striking similarity in the mortuary treatment of both humans and camelids, especially the partable and recombinant body parts, warrants further investigation. The quantitative analysis of faunal remains from Wakokoarada, alongside an examination of moche iconography, sheds new light on the ontological status and ritual significance of not just camelids, but also wild animals as different kinds of potentially persons or social beings. Therefore, this, this talk proposes a step forward to consider how animals formed part of a social world in which potentially domestic animals were understood and used in practices more associated with the human sphere or salcha, while the wild species uncovered in excavations and depicted in iconography could have been more associated with spheres of deities and ancestors or aywa. So to project focus on the site of Wakokoarada located on the, in the northern area of Moche in Florence, it's the la largest late Moche site on the south bank of the Hecatepeque River. The late Moche period in the Hecatepeque Valley witnessed the rise and interaction of multiple large ceremonial centers, unlike the Moche and Lambayeque Valleys to the south and north. The centers of San Jose del Moro and Cerro Chepen in the Hecatepeque Valley provide compelling evidence for social and ritual practices that brought both people and animals together in ceremonially and ideologically charged contexts. Huaco Colorado was occupied in the late Moche period between 600 and 900 CE, as well as during a brief transitional phase around 900 CE. The adjacent site of Tacapa is inhabited contemporaneously in the transitional and occupied until about 1050 CE. And this site in particular provides evidence for continuity and change in the representation and use of animals. Sectors A and C at Huaco Colorado were domestic and production spaces with evidence of animal and human offerings, while sector B was an elite monumental area with evidence for large feasts. So my analysis of about 600 animal images from curated museum collections in Peru and Germany, along with about 100 images from the sites of Huaco Colorado and Tecapa, reveals important distinctions between wild and domesticated species. When this line of evidence is compared to the zoarchaeological record, our analysis of over 60,000 fragments of vertebrate remains attests that camelids and coastal birds were essential sources of food, but also that marine and terrestrial predators were valued offerings to architectural renovation events. Stable and radiogenic isotope analysis indicates that human communities residing at and visiting Huacocolorada were differently contributing camelids that had distinct life histories. So when I posed the question, how were animals depicted, I established two hypotheses. My null hypothesis stated, no differences exist between the depiction of wild and domesticated species that suggests mochi artisans, patrons, and possibly society more broadly perceived of animals in similar ways. My alternative hypothesis stated, distinct patterns between the depiction of wild and domesticated species, predators and prey, marine and terrestrial taxa, relate to different ideologies that define the animal world. As the adage goes, you are what you eat. Animals have often formed the basis of subsistence studies that consider the contribution of different species to daily meals, their caloric value, and the social prestige related to obtaining wild or dangerous taxa. This perspective is an essential component to any study on animals in the past, but we also need to remember that animals are good to think with, a la Levi Strauss. Animal depictions shed light on the inner workings of artisans, their patrons, and possibly past societies more broadly. I therefore began this project by considering the way animals were represented in moche iconography. My hope was to frame my research objectives through a lens that brought in a more emic perspective, and what a better way to begin to see through moche eyes than observe their artwork more closely. My analysis of the moche iconographic corpus from museum collections housed in Germany and Peru and Huacocolorada reveals that these assemblages are dominated by sea lions, birds, and reptiles. Wild species are most common and more likely to be anthropomorphized over domesticated species. Depictions of wild animals in moche iconography suggest that these species were perceived of distinctly from domestic taxa. The corporeal division of wild animal heads, limbs, and teeth permitted ritual practitioners potentially to embody their physical and behavioral capacities. Ritual attitudes towards wild species were the result of predatory behaviors of raptors and carnivores that structured and territorialized ceremonial assemblages distinctly from those of the everyday. In the Andes, the intimate rapport of human and non-human communities 
underwrote a distinct field of dependencies and sense of community. The distinct depiction of domestic and wild species in the iconographic corpus suggests that there was a perceived biological connection inherent among the bodies of animals and humans. This implies that characteristics that were shared between specific human communities and animal taxa could index potent behavioral tendencies that were personified during ritual events. The body parts of humans and animals in ritualized contexts were treated as potential partible metonyms in which the head of one could become the head of the other, especially if we think back to the example of the deer warrior. The intentional separation of specific portions of the body appears to center around the wild animal form, but the depiction and deposition of complete camelid dog and guinea pig remains also similarly ascribe specific behavioral traits to both animals and humans. Clearly kinship structures, group affiliation and allegiance could have motivated these kinds of hybridized and naturalized depictions and depositions as a means to reinforce social exchange across species lines. So in order to, to establish expectations for my analysis of the zoarchaeological record and to answer the question, which species were consumed and which were offered in ritual, I defined two hypotheses. My null hypothesis stated, similar proportions of wild and domesticated species were recovered from elite and domestic spaces at Huaco Colorada, demonstrating that access to these taxa was not bounded by social hierarchy, but rather a collective social and economic engagement with the natural world. An alternative hypothesis stated, stark differences between elite and domestic spaces in access to different species and to particular meat cuts reinforces previous interpretations on extreme social, social inequality, dictating all aspects of sociopolitical practice among the moche. Based on my zoarchaeological analysis of disarticulated remains from floor surfaces and middens, Camelids were the principal taxon contributing to the faunal assemblage in each spatial and temporal context at Huacacolarada. This reliance highlights the way that communities were engaging with herding strategies involved in local transportation of agricultural cultigens, clay and mineral sources, foundational to ceramic and metal production, but also the interaction between coastal and highland communities. During the late Moche period, camelid remains were recovered in higher relative proportions and then southern domestic zone when compared to two, the two other sectors of Huaco Colorada. During the transitional period occupation in the elite sector, the abundance of camelids increased. This suggests that camelids, was, that camelids were integral to these feasting activities. Different faunal proxies from Huaco Colorada indicates that a large portion of wild and domestic species were exploited during the austral spring and summer between March, uh, September and March. Young camelids, deer, and sea lion remains present across sectors reflect the seasonal convergence of human societies. A common shell species, Donix ovesulus, further supports that there was a narrow seasonal occupation of the site as shell height remains within a narrow range and likely relates to seasonal harvesting of the Donix shell when communities did converge. Butchering practices uh, remained consistent through time and suggest that social memory underwrote culinary practices. Standardized minimal animal units is a quantification metric in zoarchaeological analysis that is calculated by summing the minimum number of elements, then dividing by the total number of elements per skeleton. This measurement standardizes the contribution of each skeletal element and minimizes the influence of fragmentation. This analysis reveals common patterns among butchered and distributed camelid remains and further suggest intergener intergenerational continuity in the way that camelids were tended to and shared across sectors. Food preparation techniques were maintained among communities in this region in the later Middle Horizon, but the size of camelids declined and there was a greater focus on consuming these herd animals over other terrestrial and marine fauna. Size variation among contexts indicate that there was a tendency to butcher smaller camelids in transitional feasting events. This points to communities prioritizing smaller camelids for consumption and reserving larger camelids for long distance trade. The economic value of camelids and their symbolic role as sacrifices for large feasting events. Moore notes that the proximal phalanx breadths that are generally greater than 19.5 um, millimeters tend to fall within the range of yeah, the Yama Guanaco size range while measurements that are lower than 19.5 millimeters tend to fall within the range of an alpaca vicuña size. 
This evidence may relate to transformations at the end of mo the moche cultural, moche cultural influence and local mitigation of non-local interests in the late moche cult center of Huacacolara. So the focus on camelids during the transitional may point to the intensification of long distance exchange in this later period and the continued importance of camelids in the festive economy. As part of these temporary events, camelids were incorporated as sacrificial offerings. The project has recovered five camelid burials, four from the elite sector and one from the northern domestic zone. Four of these offerings have been, are shown in the slide here. Based on my zoarchaeological analysis, it's apparent that ritual offerings of camelids were shared by community members across the site with all five camelid burials composed of juvenile individuals. None of these burials had blunt or sharp force trauma and could possibly be analogous to Inca sacrificial protocol by cutting into the abdomen and manually stopping the heart, likely by ritual specialists. Indeed, the intimate sacrifice of a camelid by manually stopping the heart attests to the familiarity of ritual practitioners with individual animals. Camelid offerings were not the only species interred at Bacocorada. Four dogs were interred across all sectors, and three guinea pig remains were, uh, three guinea pig burials were interred in the northern domestic zone and elite sector. These dog burials were often recovered from mid in context, but one dog burial was recovered on the surface of a floor that sealed the ritual offering of two adolescent women. It's this dog burial here. Um, this six-month-old dog burial was oriented along a north-south axis, and interestingly, a guinea pig offering was found 20, 20 centimeters to the south of the dog burial. It perhaps symbolically represented the final meal of the sacrificed canine. Another dog burial on the western exterior side of the elite sector, within a dense midden context, um, was oriented also along a north-south axis. The lack of a baculum suggests the individual was a female, um, and in the same midden layer, the remains of an adult human male were recovered with perimortem trauma, as well as signs of habitual stress in the upper and lower body. In addition to domestic species, wild taxa were also made as ritual offerings. A possible pampas cat offering was excavated below a floor layer in the northern middens of the elite sector. Excavations also recovered a likely dedicatory offering of a sea lion cranium with a, within a post hole um, by a ramp that led uh, to a platform on the eastern side of the elite sector. The skull belonged to an adult individual, possibly a male, and the sea lion offering parallels iconographic depictions of posts or war clubs terminating in sea lion heads. The northern domestic sector also contained two distinct offerings of deer remains. A deer limb was recovered in association with a north-south retaining wall and the burial of a young human female and a six-month-old juvenile. And in the same area to the north, a later looted tomb, uh, chamber tomb contained at least two juvenile deer. And then finally, a parrot, parrot offering was recovered from the southern domestic zone directly on the burial of an adolescent human offering. So my final live, line of evidence draws from isotope analysis to address the question of why and what animals ate and where they came from. My null hypothesis stated no differences were detected between dietary and mobility isotopes among camelids, dogs, guinea pigs, wild species, or humans from across the site, which implies that access to local and non-local camelids was equal among all social statuses. My alternative hypothesis stated groups occupying elite spaces had greater access to camelids from non-local origin that att attests to their greater influence over trade networks and tighter control of resources. Stable isotope data sets complement patterns in iconographic and zoarchaeological assemblages by revealing unique life history trends among camelids, dogs, and humans. First, for those in the audience unfamiliar with isotope analyses, dietary isotopes that include stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes are impacted by the contribution um, of, uh, to diet from different plant sources, mainly C3 plants that have lower carbon values and C4 plants that have higher carbon values. And in the Andes, a quintessential C4 plant is, is maize. Nitrogen isotopes will vary depending on the consumption of marine resources, but in agricultural crops, fertilization using guano can dramatically increase results. Broad ranges in dietary and mobility isotopes among camelids indicate that more than half of the animals consumed at Huaco Colorada were coastally raised and consumed mainly C4 plants. 
possibly mix diets between agricultural cultigens like maize or amaranth, which is also a C4 plant. But it's also important to keep in mind that many species um, on the coast, the north coast, um, the wild, wild species are also C4 plants. So it could have been a mix of, of those sources. Dog remains from the elite sector produced higher nitrogen values, perhaps the consequence of the consumption of marine resources, while guinea pigs from Takapa produced higher nitrogen values than guinea pig specimens from Wakakolara, which may suggest agricultural intensification applying fertilizer into the transitional occupation. Radiogenic strontium isotopes can also provide an essential layer of clarification for the origin of animals that vary based on their consumption of food and water from landscapes with distinct strontium ranges. In the Andes, recent ice escapes indicate that higher strontium values are found in the highlands, while on the coast, these values are lower. My results indicate important spatial differences of camelids uh, samples uh, that were detected between elite and domestic contexts in which elite contexts had greater access to non-local animals, likely from the Southern Highlands. Interestingly, three juvenile camelid offerings in the elite sector yielded local uh, strontium signatures and dietary results supporting coastal rearing. Camelids from strontium results suggesting intervalley travel or those that uh, uh, fell below local baselines yielded significantly lower carbon results than camelids herded into the, into the highlands or those that were above the baseline. So this trend may relate to the consumption of C3 plants between coastal valleys, such as um, pods from mesquite trees that grow nearby watering holes or in areas where the water table is higher. These distinct patterns in the dietary and mobility results among key domestic species indicates that local animal management was the foundation of daily and long-term activities in the southern Hecatepeque Valley, but also that periodic gatherings from non-local groups contributed highly valuable offerings for large feasting events and ceremonies. So camelids of different ages placed certain constraints on their human tenders through greater pressures present during nursing and pregnancy. For example, several samples from juvenile camelids yielded higher nitrogen values that result from nursing behavior. Um, this is complemented by strontium results in which adult camelids yielded non-local signatures. This evidence reveals the great care and management of vulnerable camelids, but also attests to the management of lactating female camelids that likely altered the daily rhythms of herding groups. The consumption of camelids that were still closely attached to their mothers demonstrate how the biological rhythms of lactating camelids prescribe human activities. Communities were structured by the investment of care and tending required for young camelids. Spring camelid birthing marked the beginning of the rainy season in the highlands, and juvenile camelids could have been perceived potentially as symbolic sacrifices to ensure renewal and prosperity for the next harvest season. Finally, in human so uh, samples, isotope results suggest a higher contribution of C4 plants in maternal diet and early life diet among children. This heightened contribution of C4 plants in the diet of pregnant women possibly relates to their migration to the coast prior to giving birth and may relate to marital bonds negotiated during temporary seasonal gatherings. For example, we successfully traced dietary change through the menarche of a pregnant burial from the ceremonial sector of Wakakorada that yielded a significant shift in later adolescence, possibly associated to changing households. Thus, women spending parts of their pregnancies in the mid valleys and highlands, then possibly traveling to the coast to give birth, linked coastal and highland communities through various stages in receiving the next generation. The combined results of this isotopic study reveals parallel movement among pregnant camelids and humans. Highland dietary contribution occurred early in the life of these individuals, but during pregnancy, communities traveled to the coast to engage in great feasts and ceremonies associated with the temporary gatherings at Waka Colorada. So it's possible that the generative powers of the cult of the Waka possibly reinvigorated the lineages of these mobile communities and the seasonal cycles of movement began anew. So based on the questions that I posed at the beginning of this talk, the following patterns can be established. Domesticated species were often depicted in a naturalized way, while wild species were often hybridized and anthropomorphized. Camelids were the most common species consumed across all sectors. 
camelids, dogs, guinea pigs, sea lions, parrots, and other birds were interred as burial and ritual offerings. Groups in the elite sector had greater access to non-local camelids that were likely pastured in maize fields, and coastal animal husbandry was abundant in domestic sectors, and camelids were pastured in mesquite tree forests. Um, and this image here you can see in the slide is actually of the Condensio uh, Forest Conservation, which is a uh, mesquite forest um, that is right next to the site. And it actually, the site of Tacapa is situated within this forest. So easy access to mesquite tree pods for camelids visiting this region. So this project began by asking the question, um, how do the behaviors, physical characteristics, and rhythms of animals shape the lives of people? But considering animals more closely, it allows for historical contextualization and the effective application of indigenous epistemologies beyond Western naturalism that recognize the value of animals in the archeological study of past cultural formations. In the Southern Jequitepeque Valley, visible on the summit of Cerro Cañoncillo, a stone wanka or monolith is situated at the peak of the mountain. Swenson and Warner argue that the site of Huacocorada was a mimetic mountain serving to imitate the shape and power of the Apu, Cerro Cañoncillo. This wanka is the most prominent part of this mountain and the remains of spondylus and copper, two valuable materials found in other mortuary contexts have been found at its foundation. Swenson asserts that this was a fearsome waka that communities living at or visiting Huacocorada could not fully incorporate or domesticate. However, approaching this monolith from the south, it resembles a camelid form and possibly did to Moche viewers. The offering of powerful materials like spondylus and copper at the base highlights the potential power of an animate being for orienting and reorienting ceremonial activities. These offerings appear to parallel the hydrocosmological scheme that depict camelids as bearers of the moisture of the Mamakocha to the highlands. The stone monument could have commemorated and materially embodied the role of the Yakana in ensuring the annual cycle of rains and agricultural renewal. Furthermore, it may have served as a marker for pilgrims to use as a moniker of the sacred landscape. Although the naturally occurring presence of this monolith might not explain the founding of Huaco Colorado, other monoliths in the valley, identified as felines and predatory birds, highlight the animal symbols that dotted the political and sacred landscape of this region. Non-human forces may have drawn in and assembled visitors from different parts of the Andes to visit and engage in ritual activities in the Cañoncillo region during the Middle Horizon. Similar to the monoliths potent and potential cosmic capacity to cycle water and fertilizing energies between distinct ecologies, it may have powerfully deterritorialized far-flung communities and re-territorialized them into these new social material confederations at Huacocorada. Salmon emphasizes that animals, plants, rocks, and water are not reduced to exploitable resources in the minds of communities relying on these entities when engaging in quotidian routines and seasonal practices. Instead, unique bonds could have formed with herd animals tended to daily, as well as with plants forged through a rotating basis. So this research reveals the way that animals were integral to subsistence practices, yes, but also as symbolic symbols and as ceremonial agents. But furthermore, they were also key elements in sociopolitical exchanges between highland and coastal groups. So before I end, I'd like to emphasize my deep commitment to supporting efforts to understand more about the cultural patrimony of descending communities, my contribution to training local Peruvian and international students in fieldwork and laboratory analysis has encompassed running workshops on the North Coast, but also in the Central and Southern Highlands. I believe that it's our duty as international researchers to bring equipment, manuals, and resources to these locations to facilitate this training and professionalization that I'm proud to say has led to many students, including um, in particular Peruvian students continuing on in archeology. span uh, So thank you for your attention and I look forward to discussing this research project with you all. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Laika. That was a really compelling and very deep research. Um, well, for all our attendees, uh, we have like the bottom Q&A to post any question that I'm going to read and be resolved by your lecture. So feel free. So we have a, a fair question is Nancy Marie White. Uh, so, does your animal bones chemistry research 
support the idea of Trustman? Great talk, thanks. Oh, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, so it it seems like at least for a portion of the of the camelids that we have found at the site um, from these different sectors, so from the elite sector and these domestic spaces, that it does seem like that there was uh, at least coastal um, animal management, um, but that there is also evidence that communities were traveling long distances, possibly engaging in transhumanist um, uh, strategies. Um, and contributing some of those animals when they did visit the site, whether it be on a seasonal basis or a periodic basis from year to year. Um, so it was a mixed set of strategies. Local manage animal management definitely was part of the sort of repertoire of how, how people were and communities were sustaining their life ways in the region. Um, and transhumanists, um, at least some groups were engaged in that sort of seasonal um, movement um, in the valley as well as throughout and, and into the highlands and farther south based off of that strontium, uh, strontium evidence. Um, so it was a, a set of different strategies and I think it's interesting to think about which groups were engaged with it and what were some of the politics and, and uh, power dynamics involved with offering animals or not offering animals and continuing on, you, on, your, on your caravan routes. So, um, so it's more, more research to be done, I'm sure. Okay, we are still open the Q&A section for more questions. Um, just a, as a complementary data about that question in your research is there's a lot of interaction between Moche and Central uh, or the Highlands communities like the Rekai culture in the Ancash region of the Caxamarca. So, there are some settlement patterns too that suggest like those transitional area where like they were moving across and occupying some buffers. And so it's very interesting to know how they, uh, so archeological data is also contributing to know how they are moving from different regions that they mm -hmm. are occupying or trying to occupy or interacting with other communities. Mm -hmm. For sure. No, I think it's interesting to think about so we know based off of the sort of broader isoscapes that do exist in the region, those very high strontium values that we do have evidence of at the site could have been coming as far south as, as the Altiplano based off of what the, those isoscapes show. But I think some of the um, higher strontium values but not super high strontium values could easily have come from areas like the central central um, Peruvian Andes in the, in the Requi zone. Um, and, it, and it does sustain, obviously, a lot of the patterns that are seen in the material culture and some of the styles and some of the um, sort of shared motifs um, and patterns among uh, the, the different ceramic styles that do show interaction and some commonality and some sort of exchange network over the long term. So I do agree. I think that there's, there's ample evidence to show closer interaction with the highlands and into, into the Ancash region, as well as even into Cajamarca and Chachapoyas and these other regions as well that are not too far away. Oh. I'm here having another couple questions. Just let me get to that. Okay. Uh, Cara, uh, Cara, quest, uh, Cara is, ans, is have a question, is greetings. May I have missed this during your presentation, but did you run multiple samples for strontium? from each individual or just one sample per individual? If one per individual, I'm wondering if you plan to submit more to gain a mobile life history of the animals to further contextualize animal mobility in the region, as that can be unclear from just one sample per individual. So mm -hmm. it can be expensive, of course. Yeah. No, it's a good question, Kara. So we, we ran um, the major, dietary as well as mobility isotopes on the same individuals. Um, so we had about, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly, I think we had about 150 camelid teeth that we ran bulk samples of carbon and nitrogen um, from the collagen of dentin. And then we did the carbonate analysis of the enamel to look at carbon and oxygen. And then also from enamel, we looked at strontium. So we have in most cases, um, we have about five different types of isotopes for the same individual. Uh, I didn't show any of the oxygen or carbon, the carbonate um, analysis, because it's 
would have probably taken another like 20 minutes <laughs> to, to give more of that data, but I just sort of highlighted um, some of the patterns, but uh, it is showing interesting patterns in at least which, which types of sort of seasonal movements that animals were going through, at least on a bulk level for the specific teeth that we were able to get down to a particular ID. Um, but it would be really interesting to do the serial sampling. Um, that was one element of cost for a PhD project. It was a little bit too much to do too much serial sampling, but it's definitely something in the future that I'd love to do um, to look at more fine grain variation. Um, among the dietary and mobility patterns, um, but based off of those sort of bulk samples and then being able to look at specific teeth. So looking at the deciduous teeth, as well as looking at the permanent dentition, it did give us a really good sense of what age um, animals were moving and potentially where pregnant females were going, because obviously um, during pregnancy, um, the, uh, the accumulation of different isotope ranges would have varied for then the, the, the offspring. And so it did give us a really good indication of where those animals were going at different points in their life. But it's, it's, a, good, it's a good point. Okay, I have oh, a whole section of questions. I have some in the, what, which one was here? Okay, Charles Hosting is asking, superbly constructed and illustrated presentation. Mocha research has indeed advanced greatly since my minor contribution there half a century ago. You and your team are gr greatly advancing our understanding of relation among people, status, wild and domesticated animals and highland and lowlife regions. Great work, just a note. Thank you so much. Uh, we have actually a question from Ryan Stewart. Sorry if I missed this, but, but is there a ritual connection in Inca ontology between the sea and the beard of fertility? So in general, the, the connection between sort of seascapes and the sea and fertility, uh, the one of sort of the key uh, materials that's used often in mortuary contexts that do pull in some of that symbolic association with the ocean and the sea is the use of spondylus shell. So spondylus shell permeates throughout the Andes through time. Um, you do see an uptick in this period in the use of spondylus shell, but it's by no means the only period that does use spondylus. You do see the use of spondylus shell in the Inca period, especially in um, mountain offerings. And interestingly, actually, you can get uh, yama, little, little yama figures actually carved into spondylus shell. And they're offered as conopas to, to um, different mountain locations. So you do get that, you do have this active association and um, use of marine species like shell brought into the mountains and offered in specific ways. So I wouldn't necessarily say it is an Andean, a pan-Andean um, practice, but you do get it in different periods of time. And there is this sort of underlying idea that fertility and the ocean and, and water and circulation of water to the mountains was, was really important. And that, that um, hydrocosmological scheme that I showed um, that was put together by Bolens um, is a really good indication of what could have potentially been widely um, thought of as, as an important circulatory power during the Inca period, but also pre in previous periods. But again, it, it's dangerous always to project any Inca or later period ideologies into the deeper past in the Andes. We don't want to sort of assume that everything was, was equal through time. Thank you for the question. Okay, we have another question. Is the, the parrot is called, is, is intriguing. Have you identified the species? And if so, where did it come from? Um, so it's a good question. So we know that it's macaw. Um, the type of macaw, no, we're not sure. Um, we know that um, in the north, the uh, general sort of um, height range and sort of altitudinal range of the Andes is not as extreme as in the south. And there are actually lower points that would have been easier to cross, relatively easier to cross in the north where the exchange between the Amazon as well as the coast uh, would have been possible. Um, the other thing that makes me think that it was potentially from the Amazon, and it could have been locally raised, it could have been something where it was like bred on the coast and locally raised. What the other thing that makes me think that it was potentially from the Amazon is that in other contexts, moche contexts, we also get um, ishpingo seeds, which are a species from the Amazon that are used in ritual practices. We also have um, evidence, wide evidence of the depiction of monkeys, different types of monkeys, so howler monkeys, spider monkeys, squirrel monkeys. Um, and so there probably would have been an open line of communication with the Amazon throughout this period 
and this beyond the moche as well. Um, so it could have been an actively traded item brought in um, and, and then offered and buried with this adolescent um, human. Um, the, the human burial in particular is interesting um, because it's a young individual and the sector within which this human burial was found was with two other young individuals around the same age, about, about eight to 12 years old. And the two other burials also have evidence of items being buried with them. So one of them was uh, copper, um, one of them had the remains of obsidian blades, um, and the sourcing of the obsidian blades were actually from the Quistacisa source, which is far south in the Andes, over a thousand kilometers south. So it could have been that the parrot buried with this one very young individual indicated maybe that this younger individual was from maybe a trading community. Um, and then these other young individuals with different craft items and trade items could have been, um, it could have been sort of an ascribed um, identity type of burial where their family members were offering the items that kind of define their guild or their status in society. So, it, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting finding and it sort of complements the other younger burials that were found in the same sector with these really key items for identifying who their, who their guilds were. Perfect. We have another question posted by, hope I'm not butchering that name, Veronique Tomsik. Hello, Alexa. Great talk. I have two questions. Did you run any intra analysis for oxygen and estrogen? And the second question is, did you identify any corals or enclosures which could be used to keep camellids near, near be this high? Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of intratooth analysis for oxygen and strontium, we have it for about 10 individuals. We um, sampled uh, some of the deciduous teeth and some of the permanent dentition. Um, and we were able to um, differentiate that there were some shifts in the overall dietary mobility patterns, um, which probably because we sampled deciduous dentition versus permanent dentition is indicating that the, um, the diet and mobility of pregnant camelids did drastically differ from once those camelids were born, um, once the offspring were actually born, that their uh, use in either local animal husbandry practices did change. Um, and so it could be that camelids that were brought to the region um, were potentially traded into other caravan groups. And so it does give us a good indication of maybe the exchange networks that were involved in maintaining probably new bloodlines and fresh bloodlines um, within these caravan groups to avoid any or too, too much inbreeding that could obviously result in um, maybe um, the, the, the birth of, of, of camelids with, with maybe um, physical deformities. Um, so that's one of them. And then the other point um, that you had about um, I think the other question, if you can remind me of the other question, I can't remember oh, let me. what she asked. Sorry, yes. I can't. Um... Yeah. Was, did you identify any coral enclosure? Oh, corals. Right. Okay. So no, <laughs> we don't have any direct evidence for corals in the region, unfortunately. But what is interesting about the site is that it is next to this mesquite tree forest. And so it would have been a really convenient area to pasture the camelids once the, the caravans actually did arrive. Um, so they could have just been passed into, in, into this, this forest, uh, forested area that would have been present probably while the site was being occupied. Um, and then formalized corrals might not have been needed to a great degree. Um, so it's interesting to think about, at least in many highland contexts, the sort of formalized corrals that you do get, you have evidence of those on the landscape, and then very little lines of evidence or few, fewer lines of evidence on the coast for active corralling, and maybe these sort of pockets of uh, trees um, where these animals would have been able to pasture from, they could have been um, convenient areas to keep those groups of animals together. So maybe what it was a different set of strategies. Um, coastal versus versus highland corralling. Okay, I guess we can do like this last question in a couple of minutes. We are already running out of time. Okay, so okay. Bruce Mainhan said, thank you for your an excellent talk. I agree with you that this is a critical not to the project or, or utilitarian division between humans and non-human animals onto other societies. What I was wondering is whether you might see might similarly want to challenge the division we habitually make between animate and inanimate. I'm mm. specifically thinking of Guillermo Salas' ethnographic research 
in which not just mountain, but agricultural fields are treated as animate. Or written Melines, grammatical analysis of Moche language, yes, in which she showed that agricultural fields were, categor were categorized as inalienable possessions along with human body, parts, and kin. Should we not think much ontology more broadly? Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that rethinking of the, the sort of duality, the duality around defining animate versus inanimate or wild versus domestic or, or what is sort of ontologically separate. And I think the, the work of um, Malian as well as Salas really sheds light on the ways that if you're living within a community and you're within a specific life way, your division from your sort of daily tasks are not, are not finally um, separate, that your daily tasks become part of you. And so the idea that an agricultural field can be just as uh, closely linked to the human body and as kin as anything else, emphasizes the way that human life ways can, can dictate and can define the way that we define ourselves. And so I think that the whole rethinking of moche ontology is something that does need to be, it does need to be think, thought through a little, in a little bit more detail. And I think that um, extending even farther beyond the separation between human and animal is also even understanding that the separation between plant and animal and plant and human is also not easily divisible. And the Moche iconography, that was an important starting point for me when I started this project, was it shows that where you have the hybridity not only between human and animal forms, but plant, animal, and human forms. Um, and so that artistic representation could have been artistic license. Sure, we could maybe belittle it or <laughs> reduce it to that. But I think it also, and more importantly, I believe that it, it shows um, that people were thinking of these different entities as being part of the kind of wider sphere that humans saw themselves as part of, um, and thinking about plants as being just as much of the, much of the human body as animals, um, emphasizes potentially extending this ontology and breaking down the division between animate and inanimate, and thinking of, again, these agricultural fields or these sort of agricultural ways of life. Um, as not being easily divisible. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. And thank you for, 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 your, for your question and your comment. And I, I, I think more work needs to be done on rethinking the way we define these ontologies. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Thank Alaika. You. Thanks to everybody who attend today. Keep tuned for the next week and our next from back. And thank you for attending. <laughs>